Welcome to the May 21st, 2015 edition of the DTM Seminar. It's a pleasure to have uh, Glenn Gaitani in our presence uh, from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, Glenn received his bachelor's from UMass Amherst and then his PhD from MIT in 1996. Uh, Glenn was uh, reminding me that uh, he, I was his first office mate. Uh, he was grad student at MIT. Uh, I was uh, leaving for the South Pacific and spending more time at Woods Hole, and uh, so I actually gave him the desk by the window. His uh, career trajectory has been upward ever since. So Glenn uh, uh, worked with Tim Grove and, and published some seminal papers on the behavior of water, um, melting of mantle peridotite, and has continued to, uh, um, to uh, follow similarly wet uh, subjects in his scientific uh, career. But today he's going to talk about what the salts tell us about the oxidation state of the upper mantle. Glenn, get back. Thank you, Eric. Uh, okay, so as Eric said, um, I've done a lot of work on volatiles um, in the past year, so I've gotten pretty interested in in uh, oxidation state uh, of the mantle. Uh, there's been a lot of of data that's being generated with the new analytical techniques, um, looking at oxidation state of iron in, in basaltic glasses, and um, I started to feel like the amount of data that we were collecting was outpacing our understanding of the process. And so I, I started looking at that, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'll start by uh, just uh, defining some terms. Oxygen fugacity, you probably all heard of fugacity in your chemistry class or your thermodynamics class and then decided to forget about it. Um, so I thought I would try to tr hopefully give it a bit of an intuitive definition here. So oxygen fugacity is a measure of the amount of oxygen available to react with elements that can exist in multiple valence states. So when we're talking about oxygen fugacity in the upper mantle, we're not talking about free oxygen. We're not talking about um, a free fluid phase. We're talking about oxygen that is bonded to things like um, iron and sulfur and um, carbon that can have multiple valence states. And then you get redox couples between these things as you change the oxidation state. Um, so the, one of the reasons that we want to know about um, upper mantle oxygen fugacity is because it controls speciation of volatiles. Okay? So if you have very low oxygen fugacity, very little oxygen around, um, the carbon uh, and hydrogen are in the reduced form. So you'd have methane and H2. Whereas under more oxidized conditions, uh, they'd be present as, as CO2 and H2O. And for several decades, people have worried about this because if you have the hydrogen and carbon present as methane and hydrogen, it doesn't flux melting of the peridotite. Whereas if it's in the more oxidized form of water, the CO2, it will flux melting. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty important distinction. Um, and the information that we have, the first-hand information about um, oxidation state of the uh, convecting upper mantle comes from measurements of ferric over total iron in basaltic glasses. And um, what I want to get at today is, is the question of, do these measurements of ferric over total iron in basalts reflect the source, um, which is what the, the assumptions are in, in interpreting the data at, at present? Does it reflect the process of partial melting, or is it a combination of the two? So when we talk about redox sensitive elements and we talk about oxygen fugacity, we're really worried about a limited number of elements. Um, and I've, I've highlighted a few of them on this periodic table. So we've got uh, vanadium, which can exist in multiple valence states in the upper mantle, um, iron, cobalt, nickel, and then carbon and sulfur, which behave are volatile elements, so are, are stable in, in fluids and gas phases. Um, and if you look at these estimates for the concentrations of these things in the bulk earth, you see that other than iron, um, the concentrations are all pretty low. And so iron is really the big player here, and it's the thing that, that we focus on when we talk about oxygen. Um, so the, it's the oxidation state of iron that is, is tying up this oxygen. Um, and if we look at the, the Earth as a whole, 
we see that there's a big range of oxidation states. The inner and outer cores contain metallic iron, um, and the upper mantle um, contains three different valence states, metallic iron, which is the reduced form, also divalent iron, or iron 2 plus, which is what we're used to thinking about, and then trivalent iron, or iron 3 plus, which is um, as modest concentrations relative to divalent iron, but it's this ratio of divalent to trivalent um, that's telling us something about oxygen fugacity. Okay, so um, I want to, it's a really important distinction to talk about the concept of absolute versus relative oxygen fugacity. This is um, what you might think of as an Arrhenius plot. This is log of oxygen fugacity versus inverse temperature. So uh, it's cold on this end and hot on this end. And as we change oxygen fugacity at a constant temperature, we, we cross several different reactions. So this reaction here is the, um, the iron wustite reaction. So it's iron metal reacting with oxygen to form wustite. So we go from metallic iron below this reaction to uh, divalent iron above it. Here's the buffer that is most uh, commonly referred to in upper mantle studies. This is the phthalite magnetite quartz buffer. So you have phthalite stable below this, which is divalent iron. And on the oxidized side of this, you have magnetite and, and quartz. So it's phthalite reacting with oxygen to form magnetite and quartz. Magnetite, of course, is a mixed valence state. So it's got 3 plus iron and 2 plus iron. Um, and then at really high oxygen fugacities, at, at very oxidized conditions, you have magnetite reaction with reacting with oxygen to form hematite, so um, all Fe3 plus. So we go from, at reduced conditions, from metallic iron through a field where you have a mix of divalent and trivalent iron, and then just trivalent iron. Um, and these reactions are very temperature dependent. Um, so at a constant oxygen fugacity, if you change the temperature, you go from relatively reduced to relatively oxidized. Um, and because of this temperature dependence, we tend to think about things in terms of relative oxygen fugacity. So what we do is basically normalize everything to this valite magnetite quartz buffer. And that's shown here. So this is referred to as delta FMQ. So it's the difference between where you are um, and where the FMQ buffer is. So now when we normalize. Um, this is the same sort of diagram, but you can see that these buffers are, are now relatively flat, okay? So you have FMQ at uh, delta FMQ at zero, obviously. You have magnetite hematite at about plus six, and you have iron wistite down around minus four. Um, so this is the way that you'll see most of the data uh, in the literature uh, plotted up, but one of the take-home messages is it's really important to think about both of these things. And if you just think about one, you can end up getting very confused. Okay, so speciation of volatiles. Uh, this is delta FMQ in log units versus mole fraction in a carbon, oxygen, hydrogen fluid in equilibrium with graphite. So this vertical line here is the graphite out. So on the to the right of this, more oxidized conditions, you have uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and graphite is not stable. Uh, below this, you see at very reduced conditions, the dominant uh, component in the fluid is methane. The second most abundant is hydrogen. And then you actually have some small amount of water and some ethane. As you go from you know uh, delta FMQ of minus five up to uh, maybe two and minus two and a half, the, you oxidize the uh, hydrogen and the methane goes away and the hydrogen, the H2 goes away and you create water. So at these conditions, water becomes the dominant uh, phase. And as you go to more oxidized conditions, you start to go to oxidize more and more of the graphite. Um, and so CO2 becomes important. So in order to, uh, to know what the species is and how your, your fluid is going to interact with peritotite, you really need to know what the oxygen capacity is. And since we, it's hard to get direct information on the speciation of the fluid, the thing that we can measure 
is the oxidation state of iron in basalts. Um, and it's been known for a long time that there's a correlation between the ferric over total iron ratio in a basalt and the oxygen fugacity. So here as we go from um, delta FNQ of minus 5, you've got about 1% of the total iron that's ferric. And as you uh, oxidize, that goes up uh, continuously. And by the time you're at uh, ferrolite magnetite quartz buffer, you've got about 15% of your total iron as ferric. So it's, it's very sensitive, and it's something that we can measure. And this, I recently discovered, this is the first, um, if you go through the literature, the first determination of ox magmatic oxygen fugacity was done by Fiodali in, in 1965. And what he did was very painstaking work. Um, he did, had to do an experiment. Each of these points is, is an experiment. He took, he took uh, a series of basalts and he equilibrated them um, at 1,200 degrees in one bar at different oxygen fugacities and measured the ferric over total iron by wet chemistry. And he found a, a, a pretty linear correlation between these two things. And then based on the uh, ferric over total iron that he measured in the, in the lava, he would inferred a oxygen fugacity of 10 to the minus 8, which is just about a log unit or so above the ferrolite magnetite quartz buffer. And what I wanted to point out is that this was hard one data. Not only for each data point did he have to do an experiment, but the, uh, the analytical procedures were, at least seemed to me, to be pretty brutal. So uh, for determination of the divalent iron, the samples were heated to boiling in 20 milliliters of sulfuric acid covered with a platinum crucible. When the steam evolved, they added HF. And the solution was allowed to boil for five to ten minutes. And this is where it really gets good. The crucible was then plunged into 600 milliliter beaker containing 5% sulfuric acid saturated with boric acid. Is I, I, <laughs> I tried to convince one of my graduate students to try this. <laughs> so this is hard one data. Um, now we, things are much simpler. Um, one of the main ways of, of making these measurements is using the synchrotron. So uh, this is uh, the synchrotron at Argon. So it's a, a ring about a kilometer across where they um, accelerate electrons to uh, near the speed of light. And because these electrons are forced to go in a circle, they give off x-rays. Um, and we use these x-rays for an amazing uh, number of things. But in this case, what we're doing is, is measuring the oxidation state of iron using something called X-ray absorption near-edge structure, or zanes. And this is how it works. So this is a plot of normalized absorbance, X-ray absorbance versus energy. And you take monochromatic X-rays to excite uh, core electrons in your sample. And each element has a characteristic absorption edge. So you see this is the absorption edge for iron, so as you increase uh, the energy of the x-rays, you get this little bump here, which is the pre-edge peak, and then you get this big absorption edge. And what this absorption edge uh, corresponds to is the energy, the x-ray energy at which you take the core electrons and you excite them enough that they actually uh, leave, the, leave the atom and ionize. Um, but before that, there's a pre-edge peak. And what this pre-edge peak is, it corresponds to the place where you take uh, core electrons, and you just excite them to the valence band. Okay, So you're not actually exciting them out of the atom, but you're just exciting them up to the valence band. And because the valence band is where uh, you know all the, the uh, 3 plus iron is, you can see that the shape of this peak is going to be sensitive to how much ferric iron is present. Okay, And the way that it, this works, here's a blow up of this pre-edge peak. Um, and if you measure glasses, you have reduced glasses. The, it's actually a sum of, of two peaks. The peak at lower energy is larger relative to the one at higher energy. And as you go to more oxidized conditions, this shifts to higher energies. And this is something that you can calibrate. This is something that Liz Cottrell and, and Katie Kelly have done a lot of work on. This is actually a figure from, from their paper. So here's the centroid energy. It's the, it's the, uh, the energy at which you have the center of that pre-edge peak. 
and it's plotted against ferric over total iron in the glass. These are uh, glasses that have had their oxidation data <coughs> determined independently by Mossbauer. And you can see that there's two working curves here. There's one for high silica things, for rhyolites, and there's another one for basalts. And the nice thing about the one for basalts is you can have tholeitic more, and you can have alkaline Hawaii, and they all fall in the same curve. So if you're trying to do things across a range of silica contents, you have to worry about uh, having the right uh, matching, basically matching the, the silica content of your glass. But if you're just working on the salts, um, things are much, much simpler. So what they do is they measure the position of the centroid energy and then read over here and get the, the ferric over total iron. And that works well independent of concentration of iron? Yes. For the so can I just so do that offset? Is that this is crystal chemistry? You get different? Yes. Uh, well, the, the, so the other it thing... It doesn't affect the, the yeah, shape right. of the... Yeah, that's right. So the other thing that I, thing that I sort of glossed over is that this, this peak is not only sensitive to um, the oxidation state of iron, but it's also sensitive to the coordination environment. So if you're doing it on minerals, it's much more tricky than, than in glasses. But, but, you know, there is that information in here, and the nice thing is that in glasses, it's, it's fairly constant. What's the advantage of... Uh, uh, so with Mossbauer, you need more sample, and you have to crush it to a powder, to analyze it as a powder. So you can't really do in situ work. Um, but the advantage of Mossbauer over Zanes is that it's a standardless procedure. So basically, they use the Mossbauer to calibrate the working curves for Zanes. And Zanes is faster too, right? Um, probably. I haven't. I'm, I haven't done any Mossbauer yet, so I don't know firsthand. Okay. So the nice thing, as I said, about the Zanes is it allows you do, to do in situ analyses. This is uh, another picture from uh, Liz and Katie's 2011 paper. This is a more pillow rim. So this is a basalt that was erupted onto the ocean floor and rapidly quenched. And in the outer portions, um, it's all glassy because it was quenched so fast. But as you move into the pillow, the cooling rate uh, systematically decreases. And so it gets more and more crystalline. The nice thing about the Zanes is you can target individual areas um, of glass, and this was just um, showing uh, that as you as the cooling rate changed from here, from very fast up here to, to relatively slower down here, they were still getting the same energy, <coughs> centroid energy. Okay, so um, as long as you're analyzing the glass, uh, this range in cooling rate doesn't. Um, this is nice because it can be done on, on submarine glasses. It can also be done on mineral hosted melting fusions. Okay, so there's a lot of data that's coming out now using techniques like this. And this is some of that data. Um, again, this is from the Cottrell and Kelly 2011 paper. There's MGO and basalt versus ferric over total iron. Um, and this is data from a bunch of different rid ridges. There's the East Pacific Rise. Whereas fracture zone and Galapagos spreading center and so on. And you can see that there's really not much of a correlation. Uh, it's a slight, maybe negative correlation, but it's not very strong between the oxidation state of the iron and the MGO and the basalt. The nice thing is that you can take this ferric over total iron and you can use the relationship between ferric iron, uh, ferric over total iron, and oxygen fugacity to calculate what the oxygen fugacity is for these samples. Okay, so this is just a histogram, relative oxygen fugacity, so it's relative to the phthalite and magnetite quartz buffer. Um, and you can see that there's a nice peak at about uh, a value of about 0.2, and there's a spread of about a log unit. Uh, but there's a nice peak, um, which you know is interpreted um, as telling us what the oxygen fugacity of the source is. Okay. Um, but one of the reasons I get interested in this is because this is really treating this problem as what we would refer to as a batch melting problem. It's assuming that your magma was in the, in the mantle in equilibrium with a prototype and then brought to the surface and erupted. And we know that's not the way the process happens. Okay? You know that um, 
that the grain scale distribution of partial milk is such that here's some, some uh, schematic olivine grains and showing how the basalt uh, distributes itself along grain boundaries. Um, the way that the partial milk uh, distributes itself produces a, um, an interconnected network. And given the interconnected network, the, the presence of the interconnected network and the density contrast between the solid and the liquid, um, you can actually get porous flow. And we know that the milk segregates pretty efficiently from the residue once it's formed. Okay, so it doesn't just sit around and you don't end up with 10 or 15% partial milk in equilibrium with the original rock that it melted from. What you do is you segregate small amounts of milk over, over a wide range of pressures and melting regime, and then you aggregate them later. It's a very, very different process. Um, so think of partial melt beneath the ridges as polyvaric, so happening over a range of pressures, and near fractional. By near fractional, what I mean is, is just what I said. Um, the melt, small amount of melt forms and it segregates. And then they go somewhere uh, shallower and they all aggregate before things erupt. Okay, so given this type of process, you have to wonder about how can we actually interpret this oxidation state data from the basaltic glasses um, as a batch melting problem. Is it really that simple? Can I ask, has it been demonstrated that when you do a small partial melt so that the, the fluid is the melt is in equilibrium with the bulk rock in terms of its oxygen for gas because fluid, water, for instance, is incompatible so it's going to tend to go into the melt. Uh, magnetite may melt faster than olivine so you might have a, a bigger uh, iron free flux to the total uh, what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna actually show in a little bit is that it's it's actually pretty easy, I mean, disequilibrium melting rates aside, if we assume that it's an equilibrium process, it's actually, pre the re-equilibration of, of oxygen to gas in the solid is actually pretty fast, because all you have to do is move point defects around. So as long as it's an equilibrium melting process, the oxygen to gas should be an equilibrium uh, at least incrementally. Okay, so the other thing that bothered me about this was that people were treating this as though it was uh, sort of a trace element, what I think of as a trace element problem. By trace element problem, what I mean is you can take a partition coefficient and an equation, plug the partition coefficient into the equation, and calculate what ferric iron does during partial melting. And so what people have been taking as, as sort of the, the paradigm is, is some numbers from a paper by Dante Camille in 1994, in which he did a rough estimate and said that the partition coefficient, so the concentration of ferric iron in the peridotite divided by the concentration of ferric iron in the basalt was about 0.1, and that the concentration of ferric iron in the primitive, or the, the fertile mantle was about 0.3 weight percent. And if you put these things together and plug them into a trace element equation, you get a curve like this. And it implies that at low degrees of melting, the ferric over total iron ratio is about 0.4, and that as you continue to melt, that ratio goes down monotonically. The problem with that is if you take it through to, to conclusion and follow the logic, here's your delta FMQ that you would calculate for this partial melt. You do the same calculation for the residue, and you get a different answer, okay? So if you just treat it as a trace element problem, you get an answer, but you get an answer in which partial melt isn't at the same oxygen fugacity as the residual prototype. And so we have to bring that equilibrium constraint to bear. We, we, need, we need to keep track of the ferric iron in a mass balance sort of way, but we also need to keep track of what oxygen fugacity the solid is recording and what oxygen Recording and 
model for the behavior of ferric over total iron during spin L layers and light partial melt. So these are the things that go into it. Uh, the major element composition of the spinel layers light melts is modeled using Roe Kinsler's 1997 model. There's some updated versions of that, um, but I think in terms of getting an internally consistent answer, this is fine. You could, you know, you could take Christy Pill's updated model if you wanted to and get a slightly different answer, but you won't draw different conclusions. We assume that the system is closed with respect to oxygen. So if you have a parcel of mantle that's rising adiabatically, that's not <coughs> exchanging energy with the surroundings, um, you can also assume that it's not going to exchange oxygen with the surroundings. Um, the, key to, the key to the solid part of the calculation is that the olivine ferric over total iron is calculated using a point defect model that was developed by Rolf Doman and Sumit Chakrabor. Okay, so for a given olivine composition, and pressure and temperature, I can calculate what the ferric over total iron should be based on point defect equilibrium. Then I need to know the ferric over total iron in the other phases, and that was done by determining exchange coefficients between orthopyroxene and olivine, clinopyroxene and olivine, spinel and olivine. So I calculate this using this point defect model. And then I say, given this ferric over total iron, and given these exchange coefficients, what is the concentration of ferric iron in the clinopyroxene and the orthopyroxene and in the spinel? And these exchange coefficients are a function of oxygen free acidity and temperature. And then this is what, what um, Eric was referring to. The ferric over total iron melt is calculated using the equation of crescent carbide from 1991. That's a pretty standard calibration that and the important thing here is that because I'm calculating the oxygen efficacy for the solid based on the solid and based on the melt independently, you know, I can require them to be in equilibrium. I can say, I, I'm going to do this partial melting calculation, and I've got this solid and this melt at these conditions. Are they giving me the same FO2? If they're not, then I need to jiggle the, the distribution of ferric iron. Yeah? Uh, I'm not familiar with the, the partial melt. It doesn't take point uh, defect equilibrium into account. This is this is just for the major element, right? So the problem with melts is you, you have to tell it to do a calculation along usually along some buffer, right? And that's that's not what we want to do. We don't want to assume that this is buffer. We want to assume that it's close to respect to oxygen. And melts doesn't have anything in it for point defect equilibrium, which is what you need to deal with the solid. But notice the Crescent Carmichael or the Kingsley. Well, the Crescent Carmichael is. Is in melts. That's the, that's the model they use. And all, all Kinsler is giving me is the total iron. So, so you know, this, this is what melts you. Yeah. For, for the Alamy model, um, does the point defect population depend on whether or not you are in equilibrium with orthopyroxene? It does. And, the, and, and he's got several solutions. And the one that I'm using is the one where the silica activity is covered by the point system. sense for how ferric iron is distributed between these phases? Like how much is in the spinel compared to the different ferric seeds? Well, the constant, so the concentration in the spinel is the highest, right? But uh, in terms of total moles, I guess. Oh, in, to in terms of total moles, um, it's not that important. Right? So, the, in, in, in sort of rough numbers, the, the, in this case, at it, it, well, it's, it's strongly dependent on the temperature. If you go down to, so if you look at, at spinel layers like xenoliths, they try to measure ferric iron and olivine and they don't find any. Um, and and Chakrabordi's model, or Doman and Chakrabordi's model predicts that at eight, 900 degrees, where these things have equilibrated, there shouldn't be any. That is, by the time you get up to magmatic conditions at 12, 1300 degrees, now two, two or three percent of your <coughs> ferric iron so the total iron in the olivine is ferric, so it redistributes itself, and it's a very strong function of temperature. But at these conditions, just just under half of your ferric iron 
because even though it's got the lowest concentration, it's got the greatest abundance. Okay, so point defects. Um, uh, I just wanted to go through and give you a quick primer on point defects. Um, there are four flavors of point defects. There's a vacancy, which is a spot in the lattice. So the, these think of these as atoms in the, in the lattice. Um, and the greenish, yellowish atoms are different from the reddish atoms. Um, so a place where there's a missing atom in the lattice, that's a vacancy. Okay, and that's, that's really what um, we're going to be concerned with. You can also have an atom that's sitting in a position that doesn't usually have an atom in it, or a, or a cation, if you will. Um, that's an interstitial. And you can either have a self-interstitial, so if, you know, if this is magnesium, and you have a magnesium sitting here, you, they're, you know, they're the same species, but they're just in different positions. You can also have an impurity interstitial, so you have an impurity here, and so maybe instead of having um, magnesium in the olivine, you've got some nickel or something, okay, so that's an impurity. And here you have that impurity that's sitting in a spot that shouldn't have anything in it. So those are the four flavors, and this is the one that we're going to be most concerned with. And there's a notation that goes along with this. Um, it's called kroger vink notation. And it, it seems a little daunting at first, but it's actually very simple and intuitive. Um, and I hope I can explain it in a, in a minute or two. <laughs> so think of this as forced right. So here's the structural formula for forced right, right? We've got a magnesium on a, on a metal site. We've got a magnesium on a different metal site. So these are octahedral sites. You've got silicon on a tetrahedral site, and you've got oxygen on an oxygen site. Okay, so this is perfectly stoichiometric force right. Now, if you have a vacancy, structural formula would look like this. Okay, you would have magnesium on a metal site, you'd have an empty metal site, then you'd have silicon on the tetrahedral site, and oxygen on the oxygen site. The notation for this is V. V is telling you what the defect species is. So in this case, there's a missing atom. So that's V for vacancy. The subscript is telling you which site it's on. So ME means it's on a metal site. So this is vacancy on a metal site. And the superscript is telling you the effective charge on the defect. Okay, so you've got um, a 2 plus cation missing. So the effective charge on this is 2 minus. That's how the notation works. This is a vacancy on a metal site, and the effective charge on it is 2 minus. If you have an impurity, you can think of that as putting iron, um, replacing the iron in forced right, the magnesium in forced right with an iron. So now you've got the species is, is the iron. X means it's, it's electri uh, electrically neutral, okay? And the subscript means that it's on a metal site. The other one that's important here is a ferric iron. So instead of a ferrous iron, you have a ferric iron. So it's 3 plus on a site that's supposed to have a divalent cation. So here it's an, it's an iron on a metal site. And the dot means the effective charge on it is plus 1. Okay, So this vacancy and this ferric iron are the two major defect types in mantelolamine. And they charge balance one another. So that means for every metal vacancy you have, you have two ferric ions. If you know the concentration of metal vacancies, you know the concentration of ferric ions associated with it, and vice versa, at least to a first approximation. Okay? So here's a plot of oxygen fugacity versus defect concentration for forced right and the olivine at 1200 degrees, so the yellow shaded region is the region of olivine stability. And you can see here is my ferric iron on a metal site. And here is my metal vacancies on a, on a metal site. And you can see that they track one another, and they're different by a factor of two. Okay, and as I increase the oxygen fugacity, I increase the ferric iron concentration, and I increase the concentration of metal vacancies. So in the model, 
This is the only. I'm assuming this is all. This is all the ferrocyanide that's there. I'm not worrying about ferrocyanide that might be charged on by sodium or lithium or aluminum somewhere. There's, if you actually look at the concentration of those things, those concentrations are going to be relatively low compared to this defect. So it's. it's I think it's safe to. Okay, so um, you mentioned the re-equilibration of oxidation state. And we know that it re equilibrates rapidly, which can be a little bit non-intuitive because oxygen diffuses really slowly in these silicates. Right? It's, it's a very slow diffusing thing. So I just want to illustrate how this works. So this is a, a perfect um, olivine lattice. The red spheres are oxygen. The orange and yellow spheres are magnesium and iron. The yellows are the M1 site, which line up in chains. And the orange ones are the M2 site, which are offset from the chains. And the, the blue spheres are the silicon. Okay, so this is our, our all the lattice. In the real world, it's not a perfect lattice. In the real world, we have vacancies, okay? an equilibrium part of every crystal. Um, it's driven by entropy. So we take one of these things away. Now we have a vacancy here. We have a missing site. And you can think of this either as a missing cation, or you can think of it as excess oxygen. Either way, it's equally valid. So as I said, oxygen doesn't move very quickly. So the question is, how can I get an equilibrium concentration of, of, these, of this, these sites of excess oxygen? Well, the way that it works is this lattice is at 12, 1300 degrees, everything's vibrating, and you have an open site here. So what happens is, the site where you have excess oxygen, the cation is going to jump into it. Okay? And then that cation is going to jump into that site, it's going to jump into that site. This is how diffusion works. You have vacancies, cations that are vibrating jump into the vacancies. And so they, they actually move like, the vacancies themselves move like gangbusters. They move orders of magnitude faster than the diffusion of the cation that is missing. Okay? So now you are able to re-equilibrate the oxygen fugacity by movement of these cations into the vacancies. And this equilibration process happens at the same rate as hydrogen diffusion. Hydrogen diffusion is the fastest thing there is in, in any of these silicates. So it's a very rapid process, very efficient process. So now we want to think about ferric over ferrous iron exchange between olivine and melt. This is the basis for the, the, the calculations. So the distribution of ferric and ferrous iron between olivine and silicate melt can be described, described by this reaction. So this involves some programmatic notation. So we have Fe2O3 in the melt, plus one half SiO2 in the melt. We have a ferrous iron, three ferrous irons sitting on a metal site, and they react to form a metal vacancy. Two ferric irons on a metal site, half of a, of a phthalate molecule, and then dump some uh, divalent iron into the melt. Okay, so we're taking some of the oxygen from the melt putting it into the olivine at this metal vacancy, charge balancing it with these ferric irons, and then reducing the melt just a little bit. So this is the equilibrium that we're using to model this. Okay? <coughs> Where's the phthalate component? Um, it stays in the olivine. So then, we needed to calibrate the exchange coefficients. And unfortunately, there is no experimental data on the oxidation state of iron in mantle mineral. Okay? And so for now, um, what I've done is taken data, MOS power data from the literature on natural spinel layers lights, calculated a temperature from two periods of thermometer of wells, and calculated the relative oxygen fugacity from the Nellwood oxybarometer. So this is a reaction in which you have um, force strike component in the or a phthalate component in the olivine um, 
going to uh, for a select component in the orthopedic scene plus magnetite in the spinel. This has been calibrated thermodynamically, and you can, it's, it's the way that, that um, oxygen pigacity for spinel layers of lysine is calculated. Okay? So for the moment, this is my calibration data. And you can see, as with all um, orthospheric samples, they, these things have equilibrated at, at, relative, at low temperatures relative to the what we're worried about at the melting regime. Um, uh, but it's going to have to do it until, until we can generate some experimental data. So here are the, shows the calibration. Here's the model for the olivine. The ferric over total iron in the olivine versus relative oxygen fugacity. Um, so you can see that it, at uh, FMQ minus two and a half or so at 1200 degrees, you've got less than 1% of your total iron is ferric in the olivine, but as you go up to FMQ, that rises to 2%. Okay. And this is also temperature dependent. The here are, this is just the observed ferric over, uh, observed exchange coefficients of ferric over ferrous iron in the CPX versus ferric over ferrous iron in the olivine, um, predicted versus observed. For the calibration, the same thing for orthopyroxene, the same thing for spinel. So this is all the Mossbauer data, and these things are calibrated, are, are parameterized in terms of temperature, oxygen fugacity, and uh, the air light content of the all. So now we can revisit batch melting. Um, and this is ferric over total iron versus melt fraction. So we're going to have a batch melting calculation at, at 1.5 GPA. Here's the ferric over total iron in the partial melt. Here's the ferric over total iron in the crudotite. You can see they both decrease with the increasing extent of melting, which makes sense from a mass balance perspective, right? Because the partial melt has more iron in it, more ferric iron in it than the crudotite does. Um, and as you increase the concentration, the, the, the mass of that melt, the concentration of ferric iron um, but the first thing that you see from this is that the, the partition coefficient for ferric iron, if you want to think about it as a partition coefficient, between crudotite and melt is about a factor of five to six higher than what not taking the estimated in the mid 90s. Okay? And you can see it's not constant, right? So you can't really do this. So this, this actually gets at, at one of the things that uh, people have been scratching their head about. Why doesn't um, the oxidation state of, of iron in the ocean-rich basalt agree with this uh, partition coefficient? And you know, one of the hypotheses is that it's more compatible than we thought. Well, it is more compatible. Here's relative oxygen fugacity versus melt fraction. We're starting at the ferrolite magnetite quartz buffer reaction. And as we increase the extent of melting, the relative oxygen fugacity goes down, which seemed pretty counterintuitive to me at first. Um, you know, if, you're, if you've got a closed system, how is the oxygen fugacity dropping by an order of magnitude just from partial melting? But in order to understand that, you have to look at the absolute oxygen fugacity. Okay, so here's inverse temperature again versus log of the oxygen fugacity. Temperature is 1200, 1300, 1400 degrees. Here's the FMQ buffer. This is where we started. And as we partially melt, the in fact, the oxygen fugacity of that system isn't the absolute oxygen fugacity is almost not changing at all. Okay, but because temperature is going up, and because the FMQ buffer is temperature sensitive, it's moving away from from the oxygen fugacity of your solid. And so, your relative oxygen fugacity is decreasing, even though your absolute oxygen fugacity is not changing very much. And it's a temperature effect. So now we want to look at the really interesting problem, and that is um, decompression partial 
polyvaric process. Um, this is temperature versus depth. Pressure's up here. And these are adiabats with different potential temperatures. So what potential temperature is, is the extrapolation of a metal adiabat to a constant pressure of one bar. So um, this parcel of metal on this adiabat has a potential temperature of about 1394. This one's about 1345. And this is about 1295. And you can see this is the slope of the adiabat. This is the slope of the metal's pretty tight solidus. According to Hirschman's parameterization from 2000, you can see that the different potential temperatures across the mantle solids at different depths. Okay, so a hotter mantle will cross the uh, solids at, at higher pressures and melt to a greater extent than a cooler mantle. So all of that sort of makes intuitive sense. Something hotter is going to melt more than something that's cooler. Okay, but this actually becomes important now if you remember that the FMQ buffer is temperature sensitive. Now I'm going to look at relative oxygen tenacities. So here is that 1396 degree potential temperature adiabat depth versus delta FMQ. And what these are are curves for different ferric over total iron in your peridotype. So we're keeping the oxygen concentration constant in the peridotype. In this case, 6%, 5%, 4%, 3% of your total iron. But we're letting it ascend adiabatically, and what you can see that the relative oxygen fugacity changes even though the oxygen content of that metal parcel is constant. A lot of that has to do with the fact that, some of it has to do with the fact that the iron is redistributing itself between the spin and the other things. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that the pressure and temperature is changing along this path, and that's moving that FMQ buffer. Yeah. This is taking both pressure and temperature okay. into account. And I actually tried to find a way to do a plot now that's a temperature plot, but it's hard because both temperature and pressure are, are dependencies and it's hard to. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the delta FMQ calculation here is taking both P and P. It's taking both P and P into account. Right. So each of, these, each of these points, I say, what's the pressure, what's the temperature, what's the pressure. Mm -hmm. um, but the other important aspect of this is that if I go from a potential temperature of 1396 to a potential temperature of 1294 for the same parcel of mantle, I've got a higher relative oxygen fugacity. So this is 6% of the total iron is ferric. Here's 6% of the total iron is ferric. But here, you've got a higher relative oxygen fugacity as compared to the hotter mantle. Right? And that's similar, you know, you can think about that as similar to what I showed for the partial melting, right? Because If I increase temperature at a constant oxygen content, I go to relatively reduced conditions. If I decrease temperature at a constant oxygen content, then they go to relatively oxidized conditions. Right? And that's, and that's a temperature effect. So you don't expect a parcel of mantle with the same content of oxygen at different temperatures to have the same relative oxygen capacity. And that is completely consistent with this, where I've got a lower temperature mantle and it's got a higher relative moved off to the moved off to the right in that green spot. Okay? So delta FMQ, relative oxygen fugacity, is something that you need to actually think pretty hard about because it's dependent on more things than just the oxygen content of the fruit. Okay? So you have to think about the absolute oxygen fugacity as well as the relative. So now we'll look at the partial melting process. So I'm going to look at two of these adiabats. These temperature versus depth. Um, sorry for the seismologist who plot things the other way. But, you know, so here's the 1396 degree adiabat. Here's the 1294 degree adiabat. The hotter adiabat crosses the solidus um, at 2.5 GPA. The cooler one crosses at 1.5 GPA. As soon as you cross the solidus, got the enthalpy of melting to contend with. Okay? So you deflect away from the adiabat, and the more you melt, the cooler your temperature is relative to 
this is an entropy of melting term, and you can see that it's present in both cases. So now let's look at delta FMQ versus depth. Here's my hot adiabat and my cool adiabat. So this is, uh, and these are both 6% of the total ionic spare. You can see that the cool adiabat is more oxidized relative to the hot adiabat. And here's what happens when you partially melt. So I'm leaving the adiabat and I'm partially melting, and my relative oxygen fugacity is increasing relative to the adiabat because of the sun. This is cooler than the adiabat, so it's going to be more oxidized. So I'm doing near fractional partial melting. I'm creating, generating 1% melt for each kilobar of decompression. Um, and I'm going from, in this case, 1.5 GPA to 0.5, and here 2.5 to 0.5. And the, the more you melt, the more oxidized you get in a relative sense. Okay? So then you take all these melts and you aggregate them. Right? Each of these is, is an incremental melt. You mix them all together. So that's what gets sampled when people look at more. <coughs> you add them all together and you, and you do what everyone does, and that is to say, I'm going to calculate the oxygen capacity for this, assuming a pressure of one bar and a temperature of 1200 degrees. Actually, it goes back to the $3. That's what, that's what the condition is. Okay? So this is what you get for this adiabat. This is what you get for this angle bat. And at first, it looks like a big mismatch, but then you have to consider the fact that we're actually concerned with things at high pressure. And the relative oxygen capacity you get from the basalt calculation is somewhere in the range of what was in the source. But the source doesn't have a single value. Okay, so it's giving you some information about the source, but it's not, this isn't exactly where the source was. The source actually had a range. A blend of all those things. Okay, so it's giving you giving you some information, but it's not as clean as we'd like. It. But that's what nature does. Okay. So now I wanted to think about things in terms of instead of thinking about things in terms of relative oxygen capacity, I wanted to, to think about it in terms of parameter that I could less sort of slippery. Okay, so I decided on the ferric over total iron concentration of the bulk prototype. So this is sodium 8 versus ferric over total iron 8. So these are, are basalt compositions that have been corrected in fractionation calculation to 8 weight percent MGO. And the idea there is that at a constant MGO content, you're taking, uh, minimizing the effects of fractional at things on a, on a more equal basis. So sodium is a proxy for extended melting, and then ferric over total iron is a proxy for oxidation state. Here's the, the Cottrell and Kelly data, and you can see once again there's a slight negative correlation, but nothing to write home about. But then I do these calculations where you hold the ferric over total iron constant and you change mantle temperature. Okay, so here's hot mantle, here's cool mantle. For a constant ferric over total iron, this is how the effect of mantle potential temperature um, effect that it should have on the ferric over total iron that we saw. So they don't, it doesn't, this isn't a hot end and a cold end. Like a hot and cold end are at high angles to the data track. And, and they actually cuts across these. So I thought, well, it's cutting across them, which means that that the ferric over total iron I would infer from the source prototype is changing. So now I've got a surface here, and for every combination of ferric over total iron in the basalt and sodium eight in the basalt, I can calculate what the ferric over total iron should have been in the source. Plot that here, and then sodium eight the proxy for extended melting, so you can then, in a rough way, say that's a proxy for potential temperature, if the mantle has a constant composition. So now I can plot potential temperature.
should the amount of ferric iron in the peritotype, basically the amount of oxygen in the peritotype, depend on the potential temperature? I don't know. But there's a few possibilities. One thing that I thought about was the effect of carbon. So this was a figure from a paper by Steno et al. in, 20, in Nature in 2013 where they did similar sorts of, of calculations in the garnet stability field. So these are adiabats with different ferric over total iron. So there's 7%, 6%, 5% in the garnet stability field. Um, and if the same thing happens as you decompress, as you go from greater depth to shallower depth, the relative oxygen capacity increases, just as, as my calculations indicate for the spinel aerosolite field. Um, what happens in this case is there's this curve that is basically graphite out, um, where you go from having reduced carbon stable to having a carbonate melt stable. And their idea was that if I've got a parcel of mantle that's got 4% of its total iron is ferric, hits this curve, it needs to oxidize the carbon. In order to oxidize the carbon, you have to get oxygen from somewhere, get a redox couple between the carbon and the oxygen. And you reduce the silicate portion of the prototype and rock size the graphite, which is, which is a really neat idea. But then you ask yourself, could this be, could this give a, give, give me different oxidation states as a function of the temperature? And the answer is no. The only thing that this cares about in terms of how much reduction in silicate you get is how much carbon you have. And there's no reason to expect that you would have a concentration of carbon correlated with. So I don't think this could be the mechanism. I'm not saying this doesn't happen. I'm saying this isn't what's setting the final oxidation state of the prototype. There's another redox couple, and that is between sulfur and iron. Okay, here's temperature versus pressure, and this are the sulfide solidus and the, sul and the peritotype solidus. So the sulfide solidus, any sulfide that's present. I should say that almost every salt you pick up is sulfide saturated, so there's sulfide in the mantle. Um, sulfide will melt at a lower temperature than the salt. So it will melt as, as your mantle is ascending adiabatically, sulfide will melt before the silicate melts. Okay? And the other interesting thing is that the relative oxygen fugacity, this relationship between relative oxygen fugacity and the amount of oxygen in the sulfide melt. So if you increase delta FMQ, you increase the concentration of oxygen in the sulfide melt. So at minus three and a half, there's almost none. By the time you're up at, at uh, close to FMQ, you've got you know, tens of weight percent. You've got 10, 12, 14 weight percent. Okay? If you think about the sulfide before it melts, it's got essentially no oxygen in it. Right? Solid sulfide can accommodate very little oxygen. So if I'm hitting this sulfide solidus and melting this solid sulfide, I've got to get oxygen from somewhere. And the obvious place to get it is the same way you did it with carbon, redox couple between the ferric iron and the peritite and the sulfide, sulfur and sulfide. Okay? But in this case, it's this oxygen concentration in the sulfide melt is sensitive to the oxygen relative oxygen fugacity, and that's a function of temperature. We found a redox couple with something that is potentially sensitive to potential temperature. Okay? So could it could it explain the data? So here is you know, you know there's a lot actually there's not a lot of experimental data to go into this. You can't do a, a real rigorous parameterization because there's so few data. But for the data that's available, doing a very simple calculation, you can see that there should be a negative cor correlation between oxygen and sulfide and mantle potential temperature. Okay? So at 1400 degrees, you're talking about full weight percent in the sulfide, and by the time you're up at temperature of 1240, you've got 12, 13 weight percent. But now you've got a redox couple that's sensitive to temp temperature, and in fact, if I can have a thousand ppm sulfur in the morb source, 
can do a pretty good job of reproducing the correlation between the temperature and the And oxidation state of the water cycle. So this is, it potentially works, but it's still somewhat speculative because of uh, our knowledge of the amount of sulfur in the water source and also the experimental data that needs to be done uh, to do a really good job. But it seems to work. So to conclude, modeling the ferric over total iron during partial melting requires ferric ferrous equilibrium between solid and melt. You can't just deal with it with a partition coefficient. You also have to have that equilibrium uh, constraint. Comparison of, of the model results with Zane's data from more glasses show correlation between potential temperature and ferric over total iron in the water source. And sulfide melting is one potential mechanism for producing this correlation. We've got some time for questions. Um, Jabron? I just have a very quickly made question about the sulfide melting process. Mm -hmm. So that implies that you oxidize sulfide to something very stable in the metal, which would be sulfate. Is that, is that the thing? No, it's not. Your, the redox couple is between. It, it's a sub, it's a, the way to think about it is in the simplest way is that a sulfide melt is, would be FES, trivalent iron. Minus sulfur. You can do the same thing with oxygen with an FeO component in the silicate melt. You're not changing the valence state of the sulfur. What you're doing is you're replacing the, some of the sulfur with oxygen. So you're changing the valence state of ion? No. In you're the just, the it's, it's just a, it's a, you could think of it as a, a solution between molten FeS and molten FeO. Right? And at a given set of pressure and temperature, going to be a certain amount of that FeO component in that molten sulfide. So it's not, it's, it's, it's a redox couple in that um, you need oxygen in the sulfide to satisfy the equilibrium condition, but you're not changing the valence state. And also I was wondering the, the steepness of the slope in the Fe3 plus uh, temperature correlation that you have, can you produce these slopes, let's say 500 ppm instead of 1000 ppm? The slope, the slope is what changes um, with the concentration of, of sulfur. So if you have less, well, How? given it gets because a thousand ppm sulfur is pretty high. It is pretty high, but also the experimental data are not very robust either. So this, as I said, somewhat speculative. Um, but um, but it it's, it could potentially work. Yeah, so I, you can argue about the amount of sulfur, but then you can also argue that you know if I had more experimental data, maybe I would need that as much sulfur. So Steve, uh, oh, there was a question in the back too. Mm -hmm. oh, Steve, well, um, so so this is a great um, um, description of the system for the closed oxygen condition, but. In the real world, it's kind of an unfair question because it's not really what you're studying or presenting here, but you know, you have a system in the oceanic slab that includes a lot of stuff going on in the surface. And, and is the system going to be closed enough to, to really not be messed up by the, you know, the, what's going on in the, in the, in the uh, uh, serpentinization of the, of the olivine and the peritite um, and releasing fluids that have. I'm not sure what. So in the, in the morb source, it's going to be. Serpentine won't be stable, right? So, uh, but in the subduction zone, that's a different. I mean, that's a different problem. Right? And you, you had your potential open with respect to oxygen, which is why I have so far stayed away from that. Right? Although I, I mean, that's going to be a, a very messy, difficult problem because of all the potentially. The but as I, you know, as I mentioned to you earlier, if you melt in a subduction zone, you're melting at temperatures that are couple hundred degrees lower than beneath the mid-ocean ridge. And that in itself will produce more oxidized magma. Um, you know, so the question is how big is that going to be? 
smartest people that I know have said don't work on some fucking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's go to Anat and then Colin and Craig. So, one of the things that um, has always confused me the most about FO2 is the difference between the FE3 class, for example, over total iron, versus the mineralogical control of the amount of FE3 plus that can even fit in the structure of whatever mineral, right? So, when I see a plot of FE3 plus as a function of temperature, I think, well, maybe vacancies will be a function of temperature, yeah. and therefore what you're showing is just that there's so much FE3 plus that can actually fit into the crystal. Yeah, that's um, that that's sort of built into what I've done, right? Um, in that the, the, the limit in this case is is, <coughs> is the ferric iron and the olive, because everything else is built off of that, right? Um, but you know, you can always put oxygen into into something else. So in terms of the bulk oxygen, you can potentially get quite a bit in by the magnet. And as you change conditions, as you change pressure and temperature conditions, it it um, it redistributes itself. You know, as I said, if you take if you take that same model and say how much fair.
dense and immiscible. And that is why I think that there's probably less certainty about the amount of sulfide in the north source than, than we think. Um, there are arguments that it will stay behind and um, it will have trouble because there's surface energy arguments that can be made that says that you'll get these sulfide plebs in the silicate melt and the silicate melt will go away and the sulfide melt um, would be such, it would be so, um, there's an energy barrier to moving the sulfide bar once the stage is where it is. And so this, there's one picture is that you have this region in the middle of molten sulfide. The molten sulfide is much, much higher concentration because as the, as the britannite is coming up and the sulfide is melting, it's the density concentration. That's, that's a real possibility. Okay. Well, let's thank you again.